Stanford University. Nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Rob Freeland. I'm Chief of Staff at Silicon Valley Bank. Um, I've been here about nine years, uh, done a number of different things within the organization. But most recently, before my Chief of Staff role started in January, I, was, um, I led business development for the Life Science Group here on the West Coast. So I've done a, 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 quite a few deals and um, happy to be here talking to you guys about, um, about venture debt and how it fits in the ecosystem. First of all, love hands. How many graduate students? Okay, so predominant group graduate students, and so undergrads. Um, what what different? I heard uh, computer science. What else? Computer science. Computer science. Computer science. Computer science. <laughs> Good, my people. Um, I'm not computer science, but I like you guys. Um, so we work predominantly with um, with computer sciences when we have. Um, when we have company founders, I'm gonna actually turn this off. Um, so we have, uh, for those of you who, uh, who don't know, Silicon Valley Bank is, um, we'll give you a background here on who we are. Um, talk a little bit about the ways to finance innovation very, very quickly so that you have a sense of where venture debt fits in. Uh, then move on to exactly what venture debt is, um, the role it plays, as well as some of the, uh, the critical factors around the use of it for companies. Um, and that's what I'll focus on is sort of the company perspective. And then get into a quick case study about a company that uh, we bridged to an, I to an IPO um, from an interesting standpoint. Um, so because it's one of my deals, I'm happy to answer questions. It's a public company, so I'll give you as much as I can. Um, but let's dive in. So Silicon Valley Bank, um, Obviously, the, uh, the name <coughs> indicates uh, where we're headquartered. Uh, we've been around since 1983. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we, we serve uh, principally the innovation economy. So we do have a small little wine practice, which, is, uh, which I would argue is part of the, um, part of the fun of, of our job in, in bringing the innovation economy into wine. And frankly, there are a number of innovators who have gone on to start wineries. So there's a tie there. It's not as loose as it sounds. <laughs> Um, as you can see here, uh, we're, we're a decently large organization, uh, total assets of uh, over $26 billion, um, and uh, total loans over $11 billion, and, and growing pretty quickly if you looked at our first quarter press release. Um, so we're the largest financial services organization for the innovation economy, and um, as you can see here, we operate uh, extensively throughout the United States, uh, and then in all the uh, gravitational tech centers around the country, around the, around the world, um, most recently opened up an office, full-scale banking operations in London <coughs> with SVB years, which is a, a major differentiator. Most banks, certainly banks that uh, are less than the, you know, are, are lower down on the list than the first three banks in the world, top three banks in the world, uh, do not actually have offices. They have correspondent relationships overseas. Uh, we think it's actually important to have SVB years across the country, across the world, um, in order to deliver on the promise we make to innovators, which is to try and make your lives easier. So uh, looking at the, the scope of how to finance a, a, an innovative company, there are, there are a number of different options as you grow through the life cycle. Um, venture debt is predominantly used early on in a company's life cycle because what happens is if you're looking at this thinking about the risk reward continuum, um, you've got down here, um, so uh, this, this axis, the horizontal axis would be, uh, I would call it risk. Um, and the, uh, the highest reward would be down here. So highest risk uh, for a lender would be in venture debt um, versus financing a large corporation with significant revenues and profits. Um, far less risky, we earn far less reward when we do those kinds of things. What we're gonna talk about today more specifically is the venture debt piece. And to level set everybody's expectations, people will refer in the, in the ecosystem will refer to venture debt when they're actually talking about something else. Um, it might be growth capital. So the way I, what I want to do to start off is, is take a second to define terms. So venture debt, as we refer to it internally, is, is a term loan that's made without covenants, uh, financial covenants, um, with a blanket lien as the security to, to the loan. So when we make, a, when we make a, a loan to a company based on its receivables, we wouldn't call that venture debt. Um, by the, by the same token, uh, a, if we made a term loan to a company that's growing and we put financial covenants on it, we will also wouldn't call that venture debt either. Um, 
be the, the term uh, venture debt, I, I think, refers to the fact that we are actually jumping into the venture with you because there's really no recourse for us to bring the company back to the table and have that conversation about how things aren't going well if there's no financial covenants. So um, we, are, we are making uh, loans to innovative companies with the expectation that we have to do enough diligence on the front end to know that um, we could lose all our money. So more specifically, um, that lack of financial covenants defines venture debt. Um, most of the time, venture debt is a three to four year term loan, and that is um, with a rate of return uh, to the lender somewhere in the, call it mid to high single digits, um, up to you know maybe 12, 13 uh, percent for a riskier deal, uh, and oftentimes outside of the Bay Area, outside the United States venture debt returns are much higher than they are here in the US. Um, that's a supply and demand function. Um, there are fewer, fewer providers overseas, particularly in, uh, in the UK and Europe. Um, as I mentioned, the security interest for a venture lender is a blanket lien in the United States uh, using a UCC filing uh, where we have uh, recourse towards all the assets of the company, um, typically uh, in terms of our market here in the Bay Area, without a lien on the intellectual property. So the intellectual property is specifically carved out. Uh, and that's, that's an important feature to, uh, to a lot of boards of directors and to, um, and to a lot of entrepreneurs because it, obviously if you're, if you're building uh, particularly a, uh, a, an IP heavy business, whether it's hardware semiconductor, whether it's life sciences and uh, taking your basic research and securing uh, the interest in that is, is oftentimes a, a deal-breaking proposition. So typically carved out. Question? So what does the blanket <coughs> lien then cover? Is it like the furniture, the office question. space? Not much. Yeah. Um, the, what, I mean, when, when a company uh, goes off the rails and we, we have to enter a bad situation and figure out how to partner with the, the management team to, for, for us to try and get whole, there's usually not much left uh, other than the, the promise and the hope of taking that intellectual property um, and doing what is, you know, the overly used term of trying to pivot the company and, and get it to a sale that, re that recoups partial uh, amount of dollars invested. Uh, but it, yes, it is the fixtures. It, it's, um, it's any licenses that, that can be worth anything are typically uh, covered in our agreements. Um, and, then, and then we oftentimes what happens is if company uh, finds itself in default, usually they have no way to, to immediately pay us back. Um, and we'll, we'll try and work with the company to figure out a way through the problem. Um, and our, our goal is never to, uh, to be the one driving the, uh, driving the train, so to speak, when it comes to a, a workout situation. Another question? Yeah, another question. Why is it a, why is it a term loan? Why not structure it as a revolver? Wouldn't that be more convenient in some instances or cases? It could be. Welcome. Uh, it could be more convenient in certain circumstances um, to have a revolver. However, many times what happens, and David can probably opine here too, um, is that uh, companies will want the security of being able to know that they have money for a given amount of time. Um, a, a revolver is typically used uh, for a company that's generating revenue and by, if you look at the number of deals done in the venture debt industry, most deals are done to either pre-revenue companies or early revenue companies where there aren't many uh, assets such as uh, accounts receivable to be able to create a borrowing base that then would allow you to do a revolving line of credit. I know that specifically IP back lending is picking up steam with the founder of RPX starting a, a group within Fortress to do that. Can you talk for a minute about the difference between the two or how, how do you see them as a competing offering for startups? So IP back lending where, um, help me, I don't, I don't know the specific example, so you'll have to help me with um, exactly what it was. Are you talking about big intellectual, intellectual property that uh, secures a very large loan? Um, so or I think talking about smaller loans? They are a big pool of capital, so that's mm -hmm. probably the main thing, but I think one of the skills they bring to the table is uh, IP underwriting. Sure. Um, coming out of RPX and therefore yep. I think they try to compete with, with typical venture debt yep. just by being able to, to give you better rates based on uh, your IP. Oftentimes um, the, the 
the companies, the, the firms that I know that, um, that do lending that is predominantly based on the idea of the intellectual, intellectual property or the enterprise value, if you will, um, have, have come at that business, at their business, um, more looking at industry comps and trying to figure out, you know, in a downside scenario, what's this company worth taking a significant discount to that, doing large loans where, where there's significant intellectual property to be had. The, the interesting thing is, in, in my old world, in, particularly with pharma assets, uh, and diagnostic and medical device companies. That's easier to do because you have basic research that underpins uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the foundation of the company and the foundation of the intellectual property. I in the event you have a software company, I think we've all seen in the news over the last particularly five years, um, intellectual property may not be worth that much. Um, and first to market means a lot more. So I would be surprised to see them do uh, a number of large software company deals. And so oftentimes they're going to be relegated, those big IP lenders are going to be relegated to, to a world where intellectual property is highly valuable and defensible. Um, but we have seen, there are a number of, um, of firms that call themselves royalty players that will come in and actually do a structured debt facility to a, to a company that has real IP. Uh, many times there are a number of royalty uh, based lenders that, that are taking a very similar approach and simply looking at um, a drug and saying, you know, here's here are the market comps. If it's not yet uh, approved, here are the market comps. Once it hits approval, it's worth X to us. We're going to give the company, you know, X minus 60% as, as a loan to propel them into commercialization. Um, those firms have been wildly successful, but that's, it's very different from, from what I would define as venture debt um, because oftentimes they're not taking the kind of proof of concept risk that we take in venture debt. So, Venture debt, I, I would say, is most often used to companies that are pre-proof of concept or, or recently post-proving uh, the concept of whatever they're attempting to do. And, and therefore, the deals are smaller. Uh, What's the average deal size? Do I don't know what average deal, I don't know that we disclose average deal size. Um, but you know, for a, for a Series A company that raises, I'll, I'll give you the market. Um, for a Series A company that raises a reasonable amount of money, call it somewhere between eight and $12 million, um, in, in a bona fide institutionally led Series A. Yeah. That company can get, depending on where the entrepreneurs came from, if they had wild success in their past company, maybe they can get $10 million of venture debt on a $9 million raise. I saw that last week. Um, that I would call... Um, Crazy. Agreed. <laughs> I was gonna be a little more diplomatic um, and, and, and call it um, aggressive, because where we are in the cycle, right? I mean, if you look, if you think about the cycle as a gauge on the horizontal axis being 180, we are pinned. Um, the, the venture debt market is as aggressive as I've ever seen it in the almost 10 years I've been working at Silicon Valley Bank. Um, so, so, it is most crazy. Fun, the most fun IP you know, debt instrument that I've seen was actually quite, quite a few years ago, and it, was, and it was the Bowie bonds, and they were the David Bowie bonds, where David Bowie literally, sorry, where David Bowie li literally securitized his record portfolio. And because there was a predictive, predictable royalty stream, he was able to sell bonds to the tunes of t tens of millions of dollars that then people bought because there was a predictable stream. Then Iron Maiden followed suit and had the Iron Maiden bonds, which also sold at a very good uh, coupon. And, uh, and both the buyers of those bonds and the portfolio holders, David Bowie and Iron Maiden, did very, very well. That is exactly the opposite of what, what you do, what we do here, where there is no predictability and the asset value uh, it could go to zero and then on plenty of occasions does. So it's an interesting contrast. Yep, yep, I would agree wholeheartedly. Um, so Blanket Lean secures venture debt uh, facilities and equity war warrant coverage is uh, one of the other major features of a, of a venture debt facility. And something we've seen, we've seen tested uh, in the marketplace over the last year. Um, we believe that, and we have, we have historical proof to look at um, the, the gains in our warrants uh, roughly offset the losses that we've incurred over the last 10 plus years um, doing venture lending. So um, don't anyone think that we're getting rich off of it, but we are recouping most of our losses. Um, and the business is a great one. Um, so let's move on to why you would use venture debt if you're an entrepreneur. If, if you think about where, where your valuation sits um, just prior to achieving a milestone, um, it's a tenuous position. And so 
if you find yourself like looking like you might either run out of cash uh, prior to achieving a major milestone, major any major inflection point, uh, whether it's hardware, you know, actually shipping a design, um, getting it to a fab, whether you're talking about a software company hitting a certain uh, you know number of number of customers to to give you critical mass, um, any 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 inflection point, venture debt can help you either achieve that milestone if you're close or Achieve, achieve it and give you time to raise more capital. So I, I think of venture debt as an instrument that allows you to maximize uh, valuation and maximize your outcome. The reality is your board members, um, some, some entrepreneurs will come to me and say, you know, hey, I, I think our trial data for you know, this new drug is gonna be great, but if it's not, I really we would love a venture debt facility. And I'll look at them and say, so you want an insurance policy? Because we don't really do those. And your board probably wouldn't like you to have that in the event that the, the clinical data goes the wrong way. The same is true for any other business. Um, it's, a, it, it is, it's, a, it's a tool for, for managing um, timing risk, I would say. So we'll jump into an example so that we'll have plenty of time for, uh, for questions. And this can really be applied. I'm not gonna talk about the specifics of, of the company simply because this is, a, this is a canvas for us to talk about the different scenarios that you might see in any given company. But um, this company is called Hyperion, and Hyperion came to us with um, about $4 million in the bank, burning about a million dollars. So 120 days of cash left. Um, positive, positive inflection point was achieved. Uh, they were trying to figure out how to get through to their next value creation point, uh, which was going to be their, uh, their their FDA approval, um, and their, the way that, the, that we looked at this when we, when we took it to our credit committee was, yeah, this is a company that's achieved something uh, very impressive, impressive, which is they have, they have great data that their product works. And they have, it was a rigorous trial, and they had proven that in the trial, the, the, company's, the company's drug was going to not just be better than the competition, it was, it was leaps and bounds better. And so the way we looked at it was, we typically don't like to do a $12.5 million debt facility uh, to a pre-revenue company uh, with no financial covenants. So we try and shy away from those. Um, we do do them sometimes, but when, when we thought about it, the company had already hit the other side of the, the major chasm Right? They'd already gotten themselves over the question of, does this work? Do the dogs eat the dog food? Uh, they were now faced with, when does, it, when does it get to the market? And that was a risk we were willing to take when we, when we looked at all the clinical data that had been submitted and all the rigor that had gone into the 12 years of clinical trials uh, that they had put themselves through. So um, we, we did the deal. Uh, we did the deal in, in April of 2012. And in August of 2012, if anybody remembers the climate back then, um, particularly for, uh, for the life sciences space. IPOs were not easy to come by at that point. It was, it was well into to 2013 before the IPO market really opened up there. Um, so we took, we just essentially took timing risk, um, that this company was either gonna be able to raise more capital or they were gonna be able to actually uh, execute an initial public offering. Um, they did execute that offering and what ensued was the run up in the stock you can see represented by the blue line. So the company, was confident they were gonna get approved. Uh, we were willing to, to take that bet, and they did so, but let's, let's look at what that meant for the shareholders, uh, and in particular for the management team. So the, the financial benefits to Hyperion is now a public company, so this is all public information, but you can see that the, the company didn't have to raise that additional $12.5 million uh, in order to propel them into commercialization. We gave them a pretty long interest only period or they did not have to pay us back principal. Uh, and that, allowed, that extended their runway pretty significantly, such that they saved 7.3% dilution uh, in not having to issue another uh, 1.2 plus million shares uh, of stock at the IPO. So um, the, the CEO and the CFO are, are friends and, and, and really great partners, and uh, we'll, we'll spare you the exact details of what we saved them, but it was a lot of money. Um, that they, they saved in getting themselves to the point where the stock was public, they got approved, 
and the, the stock has seen a, a, a pretty healthy run up um, since then. So this is, the math here is, is, is pretty simple. Um, you know, you, you do a venture debt facility at the right time and you get yourself from, and the, the software example is even maybe more stark, which is, you know, if you're growing users at a million users a month and you're getting paid in terms of valuation an extra $50 million uh, of, of value in, in terms of a pre-money between each million users and you can extend your runway another six months, another six million users, another $300 million of uh, pre-money price is worth a ton to founders. And so that's the classic technology scenario. This is the life science one. Uh, but that's the classic technology scenario that allows you to say the use of venture debt can be really smart. Um, and this is, this, the life sciences example here, frankly, is a, is a fraction of what you'd see if, you know, in any software company that you were looking at. Um, the, the additional <coughs> value driven um, by, in, by software companies um, at the right point is obviously leaps and bounds more than, than the life sciences space because um, there are many, many more buyers. So the pre-money valuations are, as we all know from, uh, from all the unicorns that are um, appearing, is um, the numbers are even, are even uh, more exacerbated or uh, exaggerated um, on the tech side. So um, let's get to, let's get to the, the meat of what I think is really important with, um, with venture debt and, and how people go about evaluating different options. Um, so the, there are obviously the considerations, interest rate, warrant coverage, uh, all, all the basics that you know, any, any good finance person can, um, can help you figure out. But when you dig down a yet another layer, some of the other questions that I counsel entrepreneurs on with respect to how do you figure out who, who, to, who to partner up with, um, predictability of capital source. There, there are a number of different sources of capital for venture lenders. Um, one of them, obviously for a bank, that's off our balance sheet. We take deposits, take those deposits, we make loans, right? Um, that, that's a pretty predictable flow, um, particularly in, in, in specifically uh, with a public company. So you can see the health of a public company. Um, when it comes to the next kind of venture lender, you have a, a private equity fund. So you have an LPGP structure, um, just, you know, just like most VCs where, you know, take money from institutional investors like Stanford's endowment, uh, put it to money, try and make your small pot of money into a really large one. Um, that's also a very stable uh, capital base from which to draw because those agreements are pretty ironclad um, for the limited partners to not pull out and uh, leave a venture lender without access to capital. Um, then beyond that, you have hedge funds that are in the business. You have, um, you have BDCs, business development corporations, uh, that, have, uh, that have a sort of a hybrid between a private equity and, and, a, and a bank um, kind of structure where they have to issue a, a, um, a dividend and that, that's their main share, uh, shareholder responsibility. Um, that gets, there's some other complications therein that, um, that we can cover later if you're interested. Um, but then the next question, who makes the credit decisions? Um, how long have they been there? Uh, what, what's, their, what's their expertise in the field that your company is in? Because the, the, more, the more somebody making a credit decision knows about your industry, the better partner they can be. Uh, because you can have that transparent dialogue and when you say, you know, hey, this is, this is really just a small glitch in the technology and you describe the technicals uh, behind whatever your glitch is, whether it's software, hardware, or life sciences, uh, if they understand those intricacies, they can be a great partner. If they don't, you worry about that person making a decision that is hasty. Question? Um, then, you know, we have here, this was, um, I think, in particular in healthcare, um, for any of you who, who happen to be uh, in, in the healthcare space, expertise in health in healthcare is even more important um, than on the tech side because of uh, the, the deep rigor of science that's important to, um, to, have, to understanding the business. Uh, future borrowing needs, um, a private equity backed venture lender has the ability to do essentially one thing, which is a term loan. Uh, they could do others, but oftentimes it's not, there's, no there's not enough financial reward for them to grow with a company 
and continue to lend to that company and provide additional financings um, into the future because their cost of capital is sort of a, they have to get a minimum return of over 10% typically in order to, to stay in business. Yeah, question? Yeah, when you mention like the, the lender's expertise in healthcare, like how do you assess like the technology and risks? You have a specific team within your bank, you outsource this, like how you have you have been building this capability within your bank? Good question. We, so we, we tend not to um, put, put ourselves in the position to be making technical decisions. Um, oftentimes, when I say expertise in healthcare, um, what, what our team knows pretty well is regulatory pathway and risks surrounding reimbursement and, and other such intricacies that are specific to healthcare. Um, so technical expertise, we have some, but it's not extensive. It's certainly nothing like a venture capital firm would have. Um, with scientific advisors. Uh, what, we, what we spend time looking at is the business of healthcare and what impacts uh, the, that business climate and changes in it would have on our companies and their future viability. So um, that's the same for software and, and hardware, uh, clean tech, everything that we do. We're, we're really looking at the business. We're not trying to make ourselves technical ex experts, which is also why we don't do those huge IP back deals is we've, our, our fundamental belief is that as the, as the financial partner, we're really not in a position to be usurping um, decisions made by the, by the venture capitalists because we're too large an organization to be making uh, rifle shot decisions about one technology. And we're, we're better off trying to build a business around or with the knowledge of being able to deliver on, um, on credit decisions based on the business. But for every dollar that VCs put in, how much is um, venture debt coming in at? Because you never hear news about a company getting venture debt. Uh, that's a, another another really interesting market question. There's there's really no. We had a rule of thumb at one point. We've thrown it out, uh, particularly in this part in the economic cycle. So it used to be twenty percent. Now, fifty, sixty. Depends on how much we like the company, um, how well we know the entrepreneurs. Uh, have we had prior success with them? Uh, you know, in, investors uh, are a significant consideration. Obviously, when you think about uh, investor dynamics, that's a huge part of what we do. Is understanding the investor dynamics is incredibly important. Um, you know, do, are there multiple multiple well-heeled investors who have invested in the company? Um, obviously, the more bright minds at the table, the the better the validation is for the company, its technology and its management team. So. Um, a lot of considerations, but um, 20 to 50 percent if you pin me down. And, and, and then how many, um, is it that the VCs are coming to you versus the entrepreneurs? Or is it a combination? It's, it's, usually, it's usually a combination. Oftentimes, you know, we say uh, most, most deals have many parents. Um, we, we try and keep ourselves immersed in the innovation economy to the point where oftentimes multiple people will come to us on the same deal. Um, to different points of contact within SVB. So it, you know, it's, it's a little of both. It used to be more skewed towards venture capital, but as the use of venture debt became more prevalent, that's shifted. Building on the technological capabilities question that was asked, um, how would you define your due diligence um, process? Is it mostly, you know, your due diligence is seeing that a bona fide VC invests, or how would you compare and contrast your process to one that the VC goes through? It, so our, our diligence process is, is significantly different than the venture capital diligence process. Uh, it's, it's less intensive. It is because venture debt uh, is, is done to companies predominantly, there are some exceptions, but predominantly to those companies who have received some institutional venture capital. Uh, with the, the original idea behind that, that concept being if, you know, if, if, an, if, if a, um, successful investor has invested in the company that validated the technology um, through their diligence. And we, we're trying to diligence the, uh, the softer side of the business. You know, management team, business plan, you know, how does it, actually how does it stack up to the companies we've seen historically in the same space? Um, you know, are there, are there projections dramatic? Are, you know, are they, are they level set? Um, those, those are the questions we're asking, and it, 
I would describe venture debt as much more of an art than a science. How often do you actually deny companies venture debt? Or do you just go about decreasing the amount you give them? So I don't have a statistic for you. Um, oftentimes, a, a company that has raised venture capital, um, many times a deal can be done. And maybe it doesn't, maybe it has more restrictions. Um, you know, I won't say there's, there's no deal we, we turn down. Um, I would say in this environment, most of the time when we decide not to compete, uh, turn, turn a company down, or, or simply tell a company, you've got a great term sheet on the table, you should take it. Um, most of the time that happens because of one of the factors. Size, structure, uh, security position uh, ha is, in our, in our mind, out, out of whack for the, um, uh, on, sort of on the risk-reward continuum. So, you know, if we don't get a blanket lien, if they say all you can have are the assets in our company, that are the, the fixed assets, um, you know, oftentimes we'll say, you know, if you want a big dollar amount, we may not be the best place for you. Um, so, you know, uh, other things here, how much is too much is probably the question of 2014. Um, we, we have seen some massive venture debt deals this year. Um, we've proposed on some of them. We've, we've said we've had to walk away from many of them because it's, it's our belief with, with the information we have about our, our own uh, historical trends we are at a, at a point in the cycle where uh, we're, we are keeping our eye very closely on credit quality, and we just absolutely can't uh, can't sacrifice that. So, um, the I'll leave you guys before we go into Q and A um, if there is any more um, key terms. So, when you think about a venture debt proposal, it it is it is far easier uh, to understand a venture debt facility uh, and the legal agreements and term sheets uh, that underpin it. Um, but here, here are some of the, some of the factors that you, you want to think about. The, the draw period, how long do you have before you actually have to advance the money uh, and start paying interest? Interest only period, I mean, how long do you have before you pay principal back? Uh, total consideration, so all the required fees plus the annual interest plus the warrants um, is that's what we would consider total consideration. Um, and that's how we would derive an IRR, would be all the fees you're required to pay over the life of the facility plus the annual interest. Um, the warrants are, are somewhat of a corollary um, in that they can't, warrants in a private company really can't be valued very effectively. So um, maturity date, funding conditions. Uh, funding conditions is, is another big one. Oftentimes if we can't, uh, if, if we really want to work with a company if we want to give them a venture debt facility, but they're, they've got a proposal that's really large, sometimes we can find a way to not put a covenant on, but say you, you say we're competing on a $10 million facility and we feel comfortable with five today, um, which has happened a, a number of times recently for us. Uh, we might say you can have five today and five after you reach a certain number of users or as soon as you finalize your design or whatever it is. Um, so funding, funding conditions um, would be different than a covenant but another way to get to larger dollars, um, at least that we employ. Um, you know, who the lenders are, what fees, how much in warrants, um, prepayment fees, um, what information we're, we're going to receive, um, facility costs, exclusivity. Yeah, another question. Um, just curious about, you know, how much do fees make up on one of these transactions? Um, so for, for our deals, they're, there are two kinds of fees. So there are the fees associated with getting the deal done, um, which is uh, almost exclusively legal, uh, and that we're really not in, in control of. So we tend not to cap our legal fees if we if we can help it, um, just because we're not in control of the you know what what number that hits, um, and we work with work with lawyers that uh, charge by the hour, um, and and then the other part is uh, fees associated with with the actual facility. So it, we're, we're a financial firm, right? So we could take 2% interest for three or four years. So long as we are actually making up the difference between that and whatever the market IRR is that we're aiming for on a given deal. Um, and we might decide to take 2% annual interest or 3% annual interest with a fee at the end that gets us whole to 
you know, five, six, seven, eight percent, depending on the, the industry and the location of the, the company. Um, and then there are, you know, there are other fees to venture debt facilities. Um, you know, it might be a prepayment penalty. There, there might be a, um, you might have a, a success fee would be another way to try and build in um, some economics that don't actually have cash flow ramifications for a company in the immediate term. Um, any number of ways to skin, to skin the cat. Sorry, can you explain what a prepayment fee is? I'm, I'm imagining I'm paying my money earlier than I need to and I'm being charged for it, is that right? Yep, yep. Um, <laughs> you're exactly right. That seems counterintuitive. Um, <laughs> Way to think by a house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but, that's let me right. Put it this way. Imagine you're paying your money back earlier and the bank's getting less interest. Mm, gotcha. okay. Imagine we set our budget for the year. You pay us off in March. We've budgeted for you to be have that money outstanding the whole the whole year. It's an attempt to get us whole, intra year. Is I mean that's the idea. Um, those those fees typically aren't very big, um, unless the only time they are larger is when we will sometimes uh, use that as a way to try and uh, make up for a lower than market IRR. So a very competitive deal. We might say, you know, we're gonna you know we know that the market is is gonna likely give a company. A deal that has an eight percent IRR. You know, we'll do the deal for seven, but instead of a two percent prepayment fee, we want four. Um, and that—that's all a function of we can pull any lever we want um, because because we are an institution that has a fair amount of flexibility with how we structure deals. We can pull any lever we want to get to the risk reward um, dynamic that we think is appropriate and. It's, it's sort of, that's a, that's a conversation that should usually happen between a lender and, and the management team. Um, but there, there are lots of ways to get to management's goals um, from a financial perspective. So like prepayments are like the positive side of the story. What about default? Like do you have some kind of statistics, statistics about the evolution of the default rate among your portfolio or some kind of number that you can disclosure? So we have uh, guided the street to a historical loss rate that is, you know, roughly four to six percent. So we have to get back <coughs> ninety-six cents or ninety-four cents on every single dollar, and the the only way to do that is to is to frankly build an ecosystem around your company, around your lending institution that allows you to maximize outcomes. So we try and work through deals with companies so that. You know, if it, if a company doesn't go well, and a lot of them don't, um, you know, those those founders in particular, that management team comes back, and so our customer acquisition cost over time is lower. Um, we hope, um, but that's that. You know, that is those are the numbers. Um, it's it's hard to maintain those numbers lending to pre-revenue companies, um, but it is it's it's an art, not a science. Thanks. Sure. Anyone else? No. So, yes. Um, in the case study you provided us and some of the um, examples you, <coughs> said, you said that a lot of times companies will come for you off for the time hedge. I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm using hedge correctly, but sure. Um, to build on that time buffer, and I'm. But you also provided an example of companies coming to you off right after they receive funding. Yes. I'm. I guess my question is when. That is true. Uh, the the earlier a company comes to us, the rosier the financial picture is, right? I mean, if you come to us, most com so most companies raise between twelve and twenty four months of cash at any given time in a venture round, and if you come to us with twenty four months of cash and we're giving you three or four year money, uh, obviously some of our risk is gone by the time uh, the company hits you know hits the um, the place in, in in the period of time or in the um, on the axis where cash is less than debt. And so, yes, companies have, they have much more leverage in the market uh, coming to a venture lender with lots of cash in the balance sheet. And so what will often happen is that company that raises two years of cash will come to a venture lender, get proposals for three-year money, and that three-year money will come with uh, you know, six-month uh, draw period. So 
you know, that puts you at still 18 months of cash when you, when you draw the money down. And beyond that, they might have six or even 12 months of interest only, depending, depending on the, the dynamics of the situation. And so oftentimes, even though you've come to a venture lender with lots of cash in your balance sheet, you're not actually pulling it down and using it and or paying it back until fairly close to when cash, you've, you've run out of cash on a net basis. So it is, um, venture lenders do expect most often, and there are some exceptions, uh, that companies will spend into their money and be a net borrower. But that is something that good entrepreneurs will say is, are you gonna be okay when I have $3 million of cash and $5 million of debt? Uh, the, answer, the answer for most good venture lenders is yes, we, that's what we expect and you know, here you go. Um, do the VCs need to prove any venture debt that the entrepreneurs take on? They do as board members. So obviously the board members have a fiduciary duty to, to do the right thing by the company and the shareholders and that is, that's a significant consideration when it comes to venture debt, there, there are many board members, um, venture investors and otherwise, who don't like the use of venture debt uh, for one reason or another. There are others that steer every single one of their companies to a venture lender and say, go get a venture debt facility. You might need it. Sure. Uh, Tom Cosby. Hey, Tom. So the question is, could you tell us how you work with uh, players in the ecosystem, the attorneys, the big four law firms, angel investors, super angels, the VCs, because SVB is known as being a really good organization to work with by the different players. And I'd like, to, I'd just like the, the students to hear more about that. Sure, yeah. We actually spend a fair amount of time and money making certain we maintain those relationships. So here at this office on Sand Hill, we have uh, a group that's dedicated to simply building relationships with, uh, with influencers in, our, in the innovation ecosystem. So we have a, a number of people, four or five people here at this office who are venture capital relationship managers. Uh, we have two people who are tasked with building an ecosystem and really just going out and adding value in the community and expecting that it will come back to us. Um, but they do that with um, seed investors, accelerators, angels. Um, those two people are based here. We have uh, w one of them actually spends 50% roughly of her time on building relationships with law firms because they are a critical component of our business in that the, the first person in the, in the service chain to see a company is the law, is the law firm in order to, to incorporate the company. And so we, those relationships mean a tremendous amount to us and we spend a lot of, uh, a lot of um, good, hard, good hard time making certain that those people understand um, our decision making process when we make a decision that they don't like and making sure that they, they understand our, our business and we, we bring them into, into the information loop um, whenever it's appropriate. Can, can, can I just give a, this will be a shameless commercial for SVB, it was not paid for. Bring it on, uh, we love those. It was borrowed against, but um, you know, I'm, I am often asked, I have spent a lot of time in particular with the government, the UK government and other governments trying to understand how does one create Silicon Valley? I mean, what is it that, why is it that Silicon Valley is outperforming the world monumentally when it comes to startups? And the answer is always, look, at the end of the day, there is this ecosystem that Professor Kosnick describes, which is designed to support this broader infrastructure to make it easier for you to succeed. And it's a little bit like card counting, which is to say you will in all likelihood not succeed, but it makes it 56, you know, 51% likely that you will succeed as opposed to 49%. And what is that 1%? And the answer is organizations like SVB. And so, you know, I have, of my companies that I've invested in, all but one, and we should work on that, uh, <laughs> banks with Silicon Valley Bank, right? And, uh, and, and the byproduct of that is twofold. One, it's, uh, I have a very deep relationship with the bank. The bank understands how I behave. And so the bank understands there is predictability about what I do when one of my companies gets in trouble. Not that they ever do, but should they? <laughs> there is predictability about I, how I behave. And there's predictability about how Silicon Valley Bank behaves, right? And, if you lack that transparency and you lack that relationship, then what happens is you're playing a game of chicken. One of you is trying to guess who's gonna do the irrational thing first, 
And therefore, either you yank all your money out and put it in another bank, or you know the bank pulls all the money out and, 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 and bankrupts you. And instead, what happens in, with Silicon Valley Bank, not just with August Capital, but with, with lots of players, is that the conversation is, we're up against the wall here. We understand the circumstance. If this company goes out of business, we all lose our money. What is the path to that not happening, right? And then it becomes a productive path towards, not always, you know, but, but as you say, there are plenty of instances where you need those warrants to make up for the time that the company loses you that money. That's totally fine, but it's eyes open and all that. So I can't overstate the degree to which that relationship and that interconnectivity um, matters and is valuable to my portfolio companies is matters to you as entrepreneurs because then you can rely on the things that are told you and you can be tr you can be open because the very single worst thing that you can do as entrepreneurs in every instance is to um, is to feel like being open and transparent about the circumstances you are in uh, is is uh, is not in your best interest because you will inevitably be make a big mistake so um, so anyway I will say and Silicon Valley Bank is not uh, necessarily the only bank that has this sort of relationship with entrepreneurs, just is the only one I work with. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that. Um, <laughs> I want to um, uh, add one, and I don't think this is working. Can you make can you turn it on? I think it's, 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 it's only recording. It's, 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 it's just for me. I know, but uh, what I'm saying isn't important enough to record. Oh, it's being recorded. Okay. You should hold it. So. Uh, I'm going to add one more short story to, to the important things that David is saying. I've loved the bank since the early 90s when I first began to work with it. And many of you know that I'm very interested in China. And a few years back, uh, Ken Wilcox decided to move to China. I mean, this guy, how old is Ken? I mean, 60, 70, something? He's, uh, he's in his early to mid-60s now. Yeah, early to mid -60s. So he takes his family, moves to Shanghai because Silicon Valley Bank is serious about China. And Ken, and Ken was our, our CEO prior yeah, Ken, to that. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Oh, Ken was our CEO yes, prior to yes. that. Yes, yeah. So, um, and he and I have been friends for a while. So anyway, fast forward, there's a Stanford alum who happens to be Singaporean who's working in Shanghai who doesn't like his employer at all. It's a bank that really is crappy. And he's saying, boy, I wish I could find a better employer. I want to stay here in Shanghai. And I said, well, you, have you heard of Silicon Valley Bank, and he's going, yeah, I think when I was at Stanford, I, so I said, I, just by chance, Ken Wilcox has moved over here, you ought to talk to him, maybe he can find you something. I wasn't thinking he'd hire him, I was thinking Ken would find him something. So two days ago, William Koo Facebook messages me saying, Tom, I'm in town today, coming in this afternoon, can I see you? And I'm going, no. And he's, so back and forth, and then he says, oh, by the way, thanks a lot. Um, I've been working with Silicon Valley Bank for the last couple of years, and Ken Wilcox is really a great guy. <laughs> and so the, the story here is Silicon Valley Bank is not just a good source of, you know, uh, venture debt or capital, you know, because you certainly do private equity stuff. It's just a great company, and you may find yourself in your career with an employer you hate. And then just ask yourself, is SVB in my city? And hopefully you've developed relationships the way that David and I and Bill and, and Ernestine have so that you'll be able to call somebody and ask if there's some way that they can help you in a professional way that isn't the same as saying, will you give me a loan or will you fund me? Great advice on both accounts. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Question? Uh, can you talk a bit more about the warrants? Because sure. I think that they should be uh, an instrumental part in getting those 96 cents on the dollar, taking into consideration the fact that you have a similar downside to, the, to that of the, the VCs carry, but you know, a highly capped um, upside. Yeah. Um, so warrants are warrants are a component of early stage lending that we feel is essential, and we take them on 99% of early stage deals. Um, I, I don't say 100% because I'm, I'm sure there are some exceptions, but certainly not many. Uh, we in our credit committee decline deals without warrants uh, on a regular basis these days. Uh, but it, so they are an essential component. Uh, the, 
there is a trick. I mean, there's sort of, there is another art in trying to figure out the negotiation between an entrepreneur and, and a lender as to how much, right? What, there's, there's obviously a prevailing um, set of terms that, that exist in the marketplace. You know, warrant coverage uh, could be somewhere between, you know, call it 2% to 10% if there's a cap table that is upside down and, and the company's shares are worth a lot less um, or the, the company's value isn't very high, maybe maybe it's slightly higher than that, but sort of call it 2 to two to 8%, 2 to 10% warrant coverage. Um, in the periods of time where we have seen, where I've been with the bank and we've seen, uh, you know, the, the market go south, um, that actually doesn't change all that much. And so the philosophy is, you know, we just keep taking warrants uh, in great companies with, with great entrepreneurs, and at some point we'll make some money off them. Um, because we have, uh, I can't remember how many warrant positions we have today, but it's in the thousands. Um, it may be in the tens of thousands at this point, and the vast majority of them are never worth anything. Um, we'd like that to not be the case, but um, that is the case, and so we just have to play the numbers game of, you know, collect them, get what you can, um, and don't put too much stock in them uh, until they're, until the company is, <laughs> oh, there he is. Um, and so I want to actually go back to, uh, to the point that, that David made, which is um, why does this work? Why does venture lending work? Because this is a relationship business. This is, this is a business that is dependent upon the two of us having a connection and, and being able to honestly say to one another, you know, you need me, I need you, let's not kid ourselves, we're in this together, um, let's figure out how to make this work um, in the best way possible. And it's that mutual dependence, that, that, that game of chicken that you never want to play, that you want to always stay in that place of mutual dependence with, uh, with your investors, with your venture lenders. And if you do, that's when Silicon Valley really works and thrives uh, as an ecosystem. And, and that's, that's the role we try to play, is a good player in that, in that relationship of mutual dependence. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.